Mind Crime Liberty Show with me, Swithin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we discuss, was King Jong Il right about mathematics? Tim, can you give us the background to this somewhat strange episode title, please? In one of like Michael Malice's experts excerpts from um, his book about the, uh, the dear leader in North uh, North Korea, he brings up an example, an absurd story, which is the first time I heard of this was um, it, when Kim Jong Il is in kindergarten. Now this is probably 100% political propaganda. May have never even happened. Um, but when Kim Jong Il was in kindergarten, um, they, the teacher says one plus one equals two. And Kim Jong Il raises his hand and says, No, uh, it's not. You have one drop of water and another drop of water. You actually have one big drop of water. Um, so one plus one does not equals two. Um, now, now again, this story probably never really happened, but but who knows? I I like the fact that they're just telling the story. Is just evidence that it's just total um, nightmare high enough state. But nonetheless, this is where another example where Oral actually predicts something that comes true in real life. Um, um in, in a way. But but as philosophically, is is Kim Jong Il correct? Um. So there's a few ways we go into this. Um, mathematics, again, I'm a lay person when it comes to mathematics. I never particularly liked mathematics or the actual mechanics of doing arithmetic when I was in school. Um, but I do like the philosophy of mathematics in general. Um, um, and and as far as the philosophy of mathematics is concerned, this is what will be more of a discussion of there. Um, so is Ken John Ill right? Well, you sent me a while back an article about um, Herbert Spencer. Um, and he, he had a very interesting discussion on the measurement systems. Um, and, and it was on the metric and the imperial units and why you adopt the metric units. And that, that sort of led me to this, creating this idea of this episode here. Uh, because, again, mathematics have always been an interesting topic. You know, people like Bertrand Russell have spent years talking about mathematics. Mathematics is oftentimes viewed as the queen or the king, so to speak, of of, of, of like logic. It's like the high you know, this is real, and so to speak. Um, um, but and you actually are and math. But if you think about mathematics, they're just in a way symbols behind things. Um, and you and I actually met on a podcast, um, and I was going on a tangent about words and do they have meaning. Um, and this is where I think you know the question, the debate over do numbers exist comes in. Um, I think I think the same debate has to occur with math as well. Again, I'm a layman in that regard, but I don't think that's an argument against me discussed. The, uh, discussing any of these topics, I think, uh, I think in this way, uh, the math people and the science people sometimes function as a functional priesthood, where you, unless you have the certain credentials, it's sort of a, a credential racket in that way. Um, but, but as back to the actual issue at hand, um, in this regard, I, I, I'm, I'm more of a fictionalist in this regard. Um, um, and this was the point I made um, on the very first podcast we met together, uh, live stream a round table, and. Um, uh, I was just saying, like, if 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 everyone says that chair, which is four legs um, and place to sit on on top, you know, that is a chair. But everyone, instead of saying that, thinks it means coffee cup. Now, in this alternate uni universe, if everyone wanted to say chair hands you a coffee cup, then in that universe, coffee cup means like a thing you sit on and chair means uh, uh, a thing that you drink coffee out of. It's hard. It's, it's very hard even to say a concept like that. Um, but this this is actually something that discuss, gets discussed at Orwell, uh, where you have the sort of obvious contradictions like black, white and double double think and um, things like that uh, and thought crime. All these sort of you know, obvious contradictions that you sort of work out. Um, and this is this is Kim Jong Un. This this goes back to the Kim Jong Un story. We get one drop, whatever drop, one big drop. Um, so. <laughs> um, so and this comes into the, the do numbers exist story. And this relates to this sort of Herbert Spencer. So, so as far as like the Herbert Spencer article to me was interesting because I've long, I've long like Nassim Taleb um, um, thought that this sort of metric system was a kind of top down imposed system. Um, um, and the imperial units are more bottom up, spontaneous. This, this also relates to Wittgenstein and Hayek. They have the same sort of, um, you know, the idea that you know, this spontaneous order, um, you know, instead of, instead of, Instead of having some scientists in some central area think up of some system, and then, then, then and this is where Spencer says, why not? Why Herbert Spencer says, why not turn the days? Why not change the number of days? Actually, Napoleon wanted to make a 10-day um, um, and change the number, you know, 
uh, or why not change how many seconds or an hour or, you know, change change those units around. Um, and actually 12, which is the imperial units, is actually much more useful. You can divide it by 6, 2, uh, 3, uh, and so forth. You can only divide 10 you really well, you can divide it by 10 times, but it's not as dividable up. There's not as many. Uh, I can't think of the word that goes in there. Um, but but and, and he also discusses the Roman numeral system as well. And the Roman numeral system, in, in a way, is more philosophically intuitive because he points out in the Roman Colosseum um, that the doors, they just they're just and, and the Roman systems at the time did not have the thing that makes it look even more confusing, which is the backwards notation where they show four as V, what is V, and I next to the left. Instead, they just show four dots. In that regard, the Roman system is sort of philosophically extremely intuitive. It just sort of exists. Um, and this goes back to the do the do numbers exist type debate. Um, and the Romans don't really have a, a zero from my understanding. Um, that comes in the Arabic numeral, you know. You know so, like, it, it, there's no such thing as zero apples or zero uh, legions or zero, you know, uh, I don't know, ch chairs. There's just... There could be one chair. You could have one legion or one soldier or one arch, but you can't have zero. That's like a, you know, it's like a non-existence factor. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, I do think in a way, um, I do think the story of Kim Jong-il Jong -il and his interesting piece of political propaganda from Orwell coming true. Um, um, but nonetheless, I do, I do think in a way, um, and of course we can, we, we can fully uh, discuss this freely, at least for now. Maybe, maybe in the future we won't be able to discuss this. Um, we can fully discuss this. And, I, and I, I do think the existence of numbers, and it does relate to things like the comment we talked about, like economics, um, because economics, you know, should have this sort of human action view. Um, um, although although, although the, there's nothing opposed to sort of the fictionalist view um, there, in, in, in my view, um, that, that says that they're just a useful thing. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's nothing wrong with... You know, saying that, you know, math is useful because we can build bridges and have exact precise measurements. And this is where imperial units are perfectly useful. Um, we got to the moon with using inches, feet, miles uh, and so forth. And actually, scientists in general do less measurements on an average basis than their average, you know, construction worker, cleric, bookkeeper and so forth, trader. Uh, and that's never an interesting point that Spencer made up that, that you know, the people that use these. And actually, that the, the, some of the more top-down systems have all these problems that need to get resolved on the ground. <clears throat> you know, in, in countries that like Iceland, Israel, and um, a few others, I just know Iceland, Israel, because I've been there. Um, one of the problems I found, and Egypt as well, one of the problems I found is that is the currency systems are so high. Like, like you can buy something that costs like two thousand dollars. Not that it costs two thousand U.S. dollars or two thousand pounds or two thousand euros. It costs only like twenty. So, so in that regard, they, they have to develop develop a, a um, they have they end up developing a notation um to do to, 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 to reduce it. it. Sort of functions like an abacus, and that's another thing. Uh, once the Romans got over a certain number, Roman numerals do become cumbersome, but then they just use an abacus. Um, um so in that regard. Um, the Roman system is extremely intuitive, extremely useful. This is a point that Taleb would make, Nassim Talebian point. <clears throat> I think Nassim Taleb once joked that that um, I cannot find the citation for this if anyone wants to go fishing for it, but I, but it sounds like something he would say. I, I remember in a Q and A, I can't find. Um, but he said that the reason the Romans didn't didn't last it so long is they um they didn't have a they didn't have they couldn't do statistics. Um, you know, because you look at Roman construction, in a way, it's somewhat overbuilt in a way. And I think one of the reasons why it probably is is because they had the kind of complicated math and that stuff that we could do in, in that in that regard. So I, I've rambled on here about what math. Again, I'm not an expert in that regard, but I do think it's an interesting topic. and I do think it relates to everyday life. And I do, in general, like using the imperialist system. Um, I have learned, based on travel, to speak metric you know when someone says something that's 10 kilometers away intuitively i've learned what that means without having to actually convert it to miles um um and the same way with celsius um uh, uh, uh but both on both accounts I, I i do think in general that 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 numbers might exist um but they're definitely useful so within any comments 
on, you know, is Kim Jong Il right about math? It's an interesting question. Again, I'm somewhat of a layman when it comes to maths, uh, which doesn't mean, though, that either of us don't have anything of merit to, to say on the subject. Um, I would tend to note that um, I know a couple of people did like math degrees. and I don't believe they ever really did any philosophy of mathematics on the course. And if they did, it was very, very minimal. Um, which is consistent with most subjects these days that you're just taught, especially undergraduate. Oh, this is just the way things are. And you learn it and you, you, you're unlikely to look at, say, the, uh, the history of mathematics. So that's interesting, the kind of controversies of the 20th century on the foundation of mathematics, um, if I remember correctly. You have the logists, you have the intuists, um, the in, intuitionists. Uh, the constructivist is a whole host of different uh, mathematical schools, uh, which I think start arising soon after, but not necessarily at the same time. You mentioned zero, which is interesting. Zero is uh, is allegedly defined properly now in te set theory, is my understanding, which was developed by uh, Gail Cantor and is defined as the empty set which I've always thought was sort of an erroneous definition, because if there's a set, surely it's something. It can't be nothing, otherwise it wouldn't be a set. Now, I imagine some mathematicians are going mental at this point. But, um, yeah, I, I, and, and interestingly as well, uh, the set theory in zero and stuff is a fa is, is thing that kind of leads um, into the work of Gödel and his... Um, uh, his, oh, I can't remember the exact name of, of, of the theory, but basically shows that mathematics is also always in, inconsistent because you can't, um, you can't, or, or it's incomplete. It's Gödel's incompleteness theory, I think it is, because you can't fully prove everything because of uh, relations of axioms. And I'm pretty sure this is a result of set theory from, from memory. So those are some rambling sort of uh, backgrounds of philosophy of mathematics. The question arises, do numbers exist? Um, the question is, well, what would numbers be if numbers did exist? It would seem to be the case that numbers, if they were to exist, would have to be non-physical if numbers really existed as such, as, as separate from um, as separate from objects. So really there you have to posit something like um, the platonic realm of numbers, which, which exists sort of as, as a separate sort of non-physical entity um, or you could say that they exist uh in in the mind now you could say that's fictional fictional in a sense um but, although then that raises the question though um does the intellect correspond to reality and i think that's really where a lot of the debate as to whether numbers exist really sort of comes from um because if you were to take say a fictionalist view of numbers um now, this isn't always the case, but it seems to me the case that the fictionalist view of numbers would correlate very strongly with a view that, well, uh, when you look at reality, well, there's no real intrinsic order within uh, nature. It's sort of just imposed upon by the mind. And this is where um, numbers are kind of fictional uh, in that sense. Now, contrast this with sort of an Aristotelian view that you have substantial forms, uh, things like trees. And, and um, the easiest way to think about it is, is living beings, which have sort of obvious um, demarcated beginnings and ends. And also things to some extent like rocks, like an individual rock. Um, I'm not talking about aggregates here, like a pile of rocks or a pile of trees or, or artifacts like televisions, which are made up of different sort of uh, natural sort of substantial forms. These substantial forms exist in the Aristotelian view, and they are distinct from other things. And if they have their own sort of um, their own uh, nature and they share uh, a get my term right, they share a genus with something else. Well, then, if you count that accurately as to what reality is, well, that number, which in a sense is, is a fit, which is an abstraction from reality in your mind, actually corresponds to uh, something which actually does exist. Now, I suppose you could make the claim, well, even if you were to take that view, you could say that, um, 
well, all you could say is there are three trees, for example, and the number three uh, represents the three trees and that sort of um, correct and true abstraction from reality. But I, I, I think it perfectly plausible then to say, well, if we have the concept of three trees, then we could have the concept of three in general. Uh, and then we can use this elsewhere. And that's sort of an abstraction. Uh, so in that view, and that's what I'm minded towards, it's more of a uh, idea that numbers don't exist, except that they are uh, a real true. Ab the ab they are an abstraction from the intellect of reality, which is true. Now, there is sort of a third position between sort of the um, the Aristotelian view and the Platonic view, which is basically numbers exist in the mind of God. And this is the idea that numbers have always existed. Uh, or numbers exist, as it were, but it is concepts. Uh, but since they've um, always existed in sort of the mind of God, as it were, there's um, it has sort of like a real existence in a way that either the fictionalist or sort of the Aristotelian abstractive view doesn't have, but need not posit this odd realm of the numbers which somehow inform reality but have no causal power of any description. Um, so that would be a sort of a brief overview of different ways you could treat um, the numbers. As, as I would say, I think the I would take more of the Aristotelian or the Thomistic view of numbers. But I think the real question, though, back to the King Jong um, Un's statement about uh, do you have two uh, raindrops or do you have a larger one, really goes back to a more, as in a sense, fundamental question, uh, which is one of ancient Greek philosophy of the one and the many. Uh, is it the case in reality that there is only one thing? Do we have monism? Is is the existence of um different objects or different people in the world merely an illusion and is we're all one in a sense of uh the ultimate brahman in um if i get that correct in, in hinduism um or is it the case that well everything is just separate and loose there's just uh, atoms floating in the void like the atomists although actually i think the atomists were monists in certain respects but you can say if it's atomist position all atoms are sort of unique and separate and there's nothing that really unites them. Although even the problem with that view is to say that, well, actually, if you have different fundamentally and unique, um, unique uh, atoms, well, you've got a kind of a way of distinguishing them. And that kind of implies some sort of uh, consistent way of at least being able to recognize the reality. But either way, you have the problem with the one and the many. You know, when does um, one drop of water when do you have two drops of water and when do you have a bigger drop of water? It's like a cloud. Um, you have one cloud and then another cloud touches it. Do you have two clouds or do you have a bigger cloud? I mean, that's that's kind of a, a fundamental problem. And, and how you go about resolving that is uh, not necessarily um, straightforward. What I would say, though, is the common sense view is to say that, well, that things do exist and they are part of, using an interesting term, um, the same genus there are there are different trees but we know they're all part of the oak tree and that seems to correspond to reality it's not just really a mental category what you were saying before about you know you could call four seven and seven four or reverse like that well that's true you could give different names to things the question is and the way i would approach it is well, does that really correspond to what actually exists um in reality so those are sort of my sort of opening thoughts on on, math, on mathematics and really the question it raises of the one and the many. Uh, I'm gonna, first of all, the, your point about m math people not being taught the foundations of math is entirely correct. Um, it, it, math people today, in a way, um, are some of the least philosophically interesting people. Actually, Richard Dawkins himself has a very negative view of philo a certain philosophy from an understanding. Uh, John Gray uh, has some just dialogues on, uh, on, uh, on Dawkins and he finds that a lot of these sort of New atheist math type people are kind of um, uh, stuck up and sort of ignorant of the foundations of the things. And one of the problems with foundation things is is, is Platonism, mathematical Platonism, is a, almost a religious position, and arguably it is a religious position. I mean, most historical, you know, the Pascals and the Newtons, they were all deeply embedded in Christian societies, and they had sort of a Christian Aristotelian Platonist type. Now, there's slight differences between all three, of course. Um, and of course, Trulon would say wretched Aristotle, but nonetheless, uh, uh, 
you know, the, 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 idea, the idea that numbers work and numbers sort of you can describe describes reality. Ease himself says that there's kind of an order to reality, which th- then we get in sort of sort of like um, this sort of you know, the, the, the dispute that like David Berlinski end up, you know, uh, would make, you know, the, 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 you know, if numbers describe the world so perfectly. I think Roger Penrose, I think, is a good Christian mathematician um, that uh, no, not him, not him. It's a different guy. Uh, but if numbers are so uh, it never described the reality so well. Um, um, you know, what exactly are they? Now, I, I think, but these are questions that a lot of, that the actual, the formal math people, the degrees, are uninterested and actually sort of have a blind spot, uh, which is one of the reasons I think I, why I want to do this episode in a way um, as well. Um, so, so the, your point about the cloud is quite interesting, but let me, let me circle back. I do think, I do think it's not a mere translation problem. Um, you know, as, uh, um, let, me get, let me gather my thoughts here. Eins, in, eins zwei, zwei is two in German. Two is in English. Uh, du, I think that's French. Uno, dos, dos, zwei, and all those, all those, uh, you know, all those words. They're all, they all infer, they all point to the same thing. Two, or what the Roman numerals would have, two dash marks. Uh, they all point to the same thing. Um, so it's not, it's not a mere translation problem. Um, that, that's not that's not what the discussion is uh, necessarily about. Although although certain languages don't have all the words for all the concepts, um, you know, I think in the Wine Dark Sea, um, the, as uh, Gladstone pointed out, Prime Minister Gladstone pointed out, like in the 1800s, this is what I heard from Talib, um, that um, the Greeks had no word for blue, um, so you had the Wine Dark Sea. Um, now, does blue exist? Well, in a way, blue exists. Um, the color blue exists, but then again, colors are on a spectrum. And this goes back to sort of the Kim Jong Un thing about you know the clouds, you know one cloud, two clouds. Is that just a bigger cloud? Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know the, the Zavai and two, um, they're basically the same thing. Uh, uh, dua, 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 two and Zavai, they all they're all they all mean the same thing. Man and der man and is man in German. Uh, you know you know it's not that's not the um, that's not the mistake there. Although there are translation problems. Umberto Eco has a great lecture on translation issues, and one of the problems that Umberto Eco points out is languages drift. Um, and because languages drift, so if you're if you're if you, if you're translating um, 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 that's actually um, if you're translating Shakespeare, which wrote in the 1600s into English uh, into Italian, do you translate it into modern day Italian or old Italian, and do you take it and take the modern English or the old English? Because English drifts, because there is a point in which in the past where languages might be um, harder to understand um, today. Um, in the same way, about there's a lot of there's a lot of slang, there's a lot of um, expressions that don't exactly line up anymore, and so forth, or they actually get even reversed. Um, and this doesn't even get into technical problems. Like we could spend hours debating on what the word liberal means, um, uh, or you know, you could spend hours debating, you know, you know how you know. How does how does Nancy Pelosi and and Thomas Jefferson and, and Thomas Paine all in a way consider themselves one word? I mean, I mean, how would Umberto Eco translate political books? That, that's a that's a great problem. Uh, I don't I don't I don't have any answer. But I do think I do think I don't think it's a translation problem in that regard. The two all in all those languages, two means roughly the same idea. Um, there's no drift. Um, now, and, and one of the jokes Umberto Eco made was actually. And this relates back to is, you know, how do you write? Well, you know, in Hebrew, you write left to right. Um, so there is also other problems. That, so, you know, writing systems can in a way change and numbering systems have the same thing, might change the way you see things. But I think numbers in a way are much closer to being unified than language as in the spoken form. Um, um, because, you know, you, you can sort of Greek mathematics look roughly the same. Although, interestingly, Greek mathematics is more of philosophy. Um, and this is another point I think that Spencer made, um, um, that, you know, pi, the Greeks just did all their math basically on their heads um, without numbers. They just sort of thought about things. Um, now, this is sort of a parody of it, but, you know, they just sort of like, you know, they take, they had these the sort of these, uh, I can't think of the term to just how they would drive, draw their circles. So to speak. But if you go out and measuring circles, of course, so the classic example of triangles, you'll never find a perfect circle or perfect triangle. Um, so do, do triangles or circles exist? Not really in reality. 
And this circles back to my earlier problem I brought up. I think this this is totally blind to all mathematics, and it's, I think it's a purposeful blind spot in a way. Um, it's a it's, it's something that they can't really get around. Um, so I I I don't I don't so swift it. I don't think it's a translation problem, uh, as I discussed. I think they all sort of point to the same things. And in this regard, I think it's fairly sound. Um, um, I'm not uh, it's, you know, we're not talking about um, any drift or expressions or complicated expressions. Um, but do you think it's somewhat a purposely a blind spot? Um, and, and do you have any further comments on on those, Swithin? So to the uh, point on the foundations of mathematics, I'd entirely agree. Um, it's true of almost all uh, subjects, especially undergraduate level. It was the same in economics. Um, you don't do any foundations of economics, really, or any of the uh, history of economic thought, anything approaching that. I think my brother did do some in of history of astronomy astronomy when he did his theoretical physics degree but it's quite rare and they did have an, a module like that for economics at my university at cardiff but then they got rid of it because a lecturer left they called the economic thought methodology so this is something consistent not just confined to maths which is uh, i think very um prevalent especially undergraduate level it seems to be the case these days that they just think well undergraduates are just to learn stuff we tell them as opposed to actually thinking um, but this goes back to um, what we discussed in previous episodes on um, what's actually the current telos, not what should be, but what it is at universities. And it's just a case of getting being rubber stamped by an official institution to say to employers, look, I am better than other people. Pay me money. You know, that, that, that's what it's there for. Uh, and also universities as well as an aside that they're just there to publish. I'm not exactly sure what their funding model lines specifically but um, it seems at least these days you've just got to publish, publish, publish. And that's not conducive to producing original or interesting work. It's just a case of, well, you know, let's just continue to plow through the current paradigm we have and what things haven't been covered within it. Just so you can fill up your 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 your, your CV, um, as it were. So, yeah, the, that is certainly a problem not looking at the foundations of uh, mathematics. Now, to my previous point, which you interpreted as saying that, well, different, um, a difference of civilizations or whatever, I implied it was just sort of a translation problem uh, rather than a substantive problem, uh, a difference, sorry, a substantive difference in the uh, approach to mathematics. Um, I don't think I would argue there, was ne there would never be any substantive approach. I just think a lot of what's claimed to be differences is actually um is actually uh translational so i mean the greeks didn't have a word for blue now does that mean they didn't recognize blue it was dark wine i think it was the dark wine was the term um i think it i suppose you could take the claim that they, they didn't understand what blue was but i think that unlikely now when it comes to numbers that's slightly different i do think there's a substantive difference between a civilization that recognizes zero um as a, as a as a number in a, in a sense um because that clearly gives you access to do lots of the maths that you otherwise couldn't you wouldn't be able to do um so i wouldn't say that um there can't be any substantive uh, differences um, but um, the reason I was use, I was coming at it in that way is a certain people who like to claim that oh there's sort of like um, I don't know if anyone heard this term but like paraconsistent maths or or there's this other maths which is sort of different and sort of oh contradictory or um, oh this shows that your maths isn't just the true the one maths and and it's like well hmm either one's right or one's wrong in almost all circumstances for that um so that's the why i, I was pressured but yeah certainly zero i think gives you a, a substantive difference in what you can do infinity is an interesting one as well um now that does let you do more things the question with infinity whether it makes kind of any sense well i mean i suppose zero and infinity do make sense zero is well i did have something and now i don't okay fine that's zero in a sense. And infinity is, well, you just keep going. Again, that's cogent. The issue is when you try and treat, as I've mentioned before, zero is like an absolute platonic number. 
and then an, an, an infinity which is completed, which is, as I say, that goes to Cantor, uh, who was set theory in the late 19th century, um, which again just is, at least on the surface, is an absurd concept. Um, so, um, yeah, there can be substantive, but there's also, you could argue, in a sense of pragmatic difference, uh, there's various civilizations which have like, really really um fine grade dif- distinctions between certain types of snakes and they give them different names whereas we just say it's a snake but for their practical purpose uh because they can get killed by them quite regularly or they um they have a lot of more intimate relations with snakes than we do in the west and so it would make sense then that you would have more fine grade distinctions than you would have elsewhere so i suppose you could have an analogous approach say say maths uh but I would say ultimately it would be consistent. It wouldn't be uh, if it was correct maths, as it were, it, it wouldn't be um, contradictory. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense in a way. Um, but I do I do think that uh, math in some ways is a kind of platonic religion, especially for the people who um, treat it as such. Now, I'm fine with religions, by the way. I'm not against it. Um, but I, I do I do think the actual underpinnings of math kind of um ethereal uh, you know that you know when you when you when you see the, the physics people um discuss math it's, it's they just sort of they just they just sort of just say that these numbers just exist in these equations with full of numbers or or seeming um variables um they just sort of exist and i had the same experience with political science uh, you know they just sort of just treat the methodology as a sort of black box I think I think that's the same treatment that math gets, just a kind of black box. You're not really allowed to look behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, so in that regard, in that regard, what the people commonly classify as postmodernists, and actually vaguely might be considered a right-wing postmodernist, um, um, the, you know, you just look underneath the sort of black box that uh, people uh, discuss the sort of math. I mean, I and I think zero is an interesting concept as well because you know, as, as a kid, I always Negative numbers always screwed me up, and I think the reason they screwed me up is technically negative numbers are distance from zero. Um, they're not like true per se opposites. So it's like on a number line, so you have to sort of have the the rabbit has to go down the hole too. These but it's zero to one, one to two. Um, you know that's actually you know distance from zero. Um, so so I, when I learned about the Roman numerals and not having zero, I've always I've always found that uh, fairly interesting. Um, as far as the the power consistent thing. Uh, I'm I'm neither here nor there. I, I, in some ways, that's above. In some ways, that's above my pay grade, and in some ways, it's just out. It's, I have no no actual interest. In it. Um, um, a lot of people criticize. Uh, for example, a lot of people will criticize the flat earthers. For example, you can get you can get away with and here's, you can you can travel most everywhere using fairly effective flat Earth maps. Um, you can travel the Atlantic. You can travel the Pacific. Um, the only trouble is y- y- around Antarctica. If you, if you take the sort of uh, disk model of the, the flat earthers have, which again, there's a lot of epicycles in it. Um, but but I think a similar analogy exists for math. Um, useful math that's good enough is just as good, is, is in most circumstances just as good as you know more rigid math, which relates to the sort of dispute between centigrade uh, meters and material units. We'll say the imperial units are kind of uh, asinine and arbitrary. Well, then again, arguably imperial, the centigrade and meters are equally asinine. And then that goes back to use. You know, why? Why do physicists and so forth do use math? Why do mathematicians use math? Um, and and then this, this this bleeds into what I would argue is a why question, which they're completely unable answer outside of well we get paid to by university to do so there's sort of explicit purpose um it's sort of crass reasoning why they don't answer these questions um but even then i, I but those are my general thoughts regarding math um if you want to comment on that swithin and then maybe you'll start wrapping it up oh yeah um it's it's i, I do think that maths in a sense is a religion um I believe Pythagoras um, was a bit of a mystic and uh, worshipped numbers. He was kind of like a, uh, a more practicing Platonist. Although I'm not entirely sure that he had necessarily the same views as Plato did over numbers. 
Um, but yeah, they, they are certainly, um, they are, they, they, there's certainly definitely a relation there. Um, and yes, I, I, I do think with, with, how should we say, particularly you could call advanced maths, it, it, it is just, yes, it, it is somewhat un, lacks um, solid foundations, shall we say, maybe the best way of describing it. Uh, physicists um, seem to be very much enamoured uh, with them. Although the thing you think is physicists, physicists have sort of, because you've got rid of any sort of notion of realism in science to a large extent, although it is coming back so in sort of physics, it's all about, oh, it's all about um, the predictive modelling and then oh, it's just all about the maths. And it's like, well, it's pretty sure it's about the physics rather than the maths. But, it, but, but my understanding is that they're very much concerned about just um, similarly with economics to some extent, you know, it's just it's, it's mathematical uh, modeling. And so therefore you just have to have a high regard for the math. Um, uh, otherwise, the approach uh, makes no sense. Oh, yeah. Imperial and metric units. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, you could say my position is somewhat of an extreme position, uh, which, which I, I like aesthetically. Is that I, I, would, I would take the view that, yes, maths is consistent and it should be rigorous and it should be logical. However, when we come to measurements, in sort of empirical measurements well you know as long as they're accurate as in they're repeatable and you know what they are every time well then a priori there's no reason necessarily to use one over another but given the fact that you're going to be measuring for particular purposes and this happens to be the case that historically now at least in western europe um i don't know what about the measurement systems in other countries that's interesting i never really thought about it um is that um you've they, they've used the imperial system it's only um since the french revolution where governments have decided no 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 we should use this logical rigorous system which is how the sensor points out you know it isn't necessarily uh logical or rigorous in in the way which they claim um you know as you said before you know um it's divisible only by like five and two the fact is only five and two twelve you can divide by four and three um, also, there's a question of, you know, with the metric system is you, you've created a measurement system, then you try to get the world to conform to it rather than going out into the world and going, well, what is the world like? Let's measure it. You know, the 360 degrees in a circle, the 365 days in a year, the 60 minutes in, in a, an hour, uh, 24 hours in a day. You know, this isn't all round numbers, but these are numbers which reflect reality. And that's really what Herbert Spencer's position was. Um, so. <clears throat> I think there's there's definitely a, a difference between sort of the measurements that you would use and sort of the foundations of the that you do use. Oh, yeah. On on negative numbers. Yeah. Negative numbers are weird. And that's I've taught lots of people who aren't very good at maths at that. And then they're, they're very bad at negative numbers because they don't really make a huge amount of sense. And as you said, the best way to think about it is one of position. How do you have negative numbers? Oh, well you um, are going backwards effectively from a point that's what negative means otherwise like, well, how can something be negative and be positive as in it exists in the sense it's positive and also be negative uh, it's like well well, well it can't uh, and another way I'd, I'd explain negative is like an overdraft you know you've got minus a thousand pounds in the bank what does that mean well it means you owe somebody a thousand owe the bank a thousand pounds so yeah there are lots of errors you can make with minuses and um, with Fahrenheit I did, I did a test um, I thought, well, what's zero Fahrenheit? And it's actually like minus 18 degrees C. And unless you're in Canada uh, or probably Russia, I don't think you're ever going to get to minus 18 particularly often. Um, so actually going down to zero Fahrenheit is kind of like, well, rare. And, um, you know, it's, it's actually quite useful and you're always in a positive number. Now, there's also more fine gradations. A degree, I think, is like 1.8 Fahrenheit. So each Fahrenheit is quite... Is, is somewhat more accurate in its measurement and this is someone who's not a fahrenheit native i'm a celsius native in england when i growing up we had an odd thing whereas I, I was used to imperial in everything apart from um temperature which i never was i knew metric as well but we'd always do um we'd always do temperature in uh celsius and obviously in england we have miles as well so we always had that as, as, as imperial so, so my final question to answer the the starting question of the episode is Kim Jong Kim Jong Il or Kim Jong Un right about math? And I'd say maybe. 
I say maybe. Although, I, although I don't, in this regard, Kim Jong Il is very much wrong in the sense that, uh, you know, if you uh, want to use a useful system, you're not allowed to use a useful system. You have to use the state system. And actually, one of the reasons why the Phoenicians developed standardized math, uh, standardized units of language, I think the alphabet origin is from this, is so they could collect taxes. Um, it's very, you know, it's, 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 it's much easier to much easier to have taxes when everyone has the same units and measurement systems. Um, it's much harder. And that's why I think one of the reasons why the European, would the European Union be impossible without the metric system? Probably not. Uh, because then, I mean, having a leader, you have, you know, the French use one system, the Italians use another. The same way in the United States, uh, the, you know, the those standards, weights, and measurement. Now, of course, the always the criticism is, well, then, then locals could uh, defraud them with different things. Well, that's that's true, but then the taxman could just defraud them as well. A lot of standardization has nothing to do with scientific necessity. It has to do with um, the state wanting to uh, uh, better control its population. Uh, so, and actually, I actually argue that having local measurement system is a kind of uh, a kind of resistance. Um, and actually, in Canada, it's interesting. Canada has sort of two-way fight between imperial and metric. I was once on a um, there was once some Canadians there. They said, asking, they said, "What's the temperature?" And they said, "Well, aren't you going to use Celsius?" And they said, "No, we 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 still stick. We we private we use Fahrenheit," um, which I found was I found was an interesting comment. Um, but nonetheless, um, Kim Jong Un may be right about math, but then again, this is where actually business people are just much in the postmodernist camp, where they just it just math becomes a kind of religion for them. And again, I'm not against religions, um, but but um, this this kind of religion gets imposed on them. As I say with my comments on the flat Earth view, you can you can get between England and um, you know Columbus. Still, I'm not exactly sure what Columbus's private views on the Earth day, but he still managed to sail the ocean blue. A lot of these guys, you can still do a lot of sailing. So I think in that regard, math is useful up to a point. Um, um, and once the model gets into this sort of ethereal realm, um, it is just sort of ethereal. So, so maybe it would be my answer to the episode's title. So, with any, any final comments, and then enjoyed discussing with you. Um, not, not really. Just to reiterate uh, uh, that uh, I, I think one of the, the big questions when it comes to maths uh, is, with back to King John uh, Eel's point, is uh, the one and the many. You know, what actually exists in reality, and then how do we? Uh, map maths onto it i think that's the interesting one it's like would you have um a water drop and goes to another one is that a bigger one or do you have two it's like well well that kind of depends on sort of like composition and kind of unity and reality and i i, I, w- I would also say though whilst men saying that if you're doing a measurement system you should make it as sort of practical as possible because that's what the purpose of measurement is uh, I just now like to thank everyone for listening. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to us on YouTube and Podbean and share it with your friends and family. And if you'd like to contact the show for any reason, any ideas or any comments you'd like to make, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. <laughs>